Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD, General Physician. All my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. All the material, whatever is gathered, is from YouTube, from Google, from slideshare.com and other. Today we will be discussing on one of the very interesting topic which you come across in your everyday practice that is hypoglycemia that will be very useful to all medical students particularly fourth year interns while doing private practice and this will be seen in a diabetic as well as non-diabetic person. So you should be aware of this condition and there are lot of things which we should be aware of it and we can prevent the morbidity as well as mortality. So we will be discussing on what we call as hypoglycemia. The term is very simple, hypo means low, glycemia means blood, sugar level in blood. So low blood sugar level, we label that as hypoglycemia. We will be discussing under these headings, definition, etiology, what are the causes of hypoglycemia, then pathophysiology, what happens, clinical features, investigations, differential diagnosis, treatment and complications. By definition, there are figure changes, that is value of sugar in blood changes. In a non-diabetic person, if blood sugar is less than 50, we label that as hypoglycemia or we call 2.8 millimole. While in a diabetic person, less than 70 milligram per deciliter or we 3.9 millimole per liter. These are the two value in a non-diabetic less than 50, in a diabetic less than 70. With or without symptoms which we divide into two big groups, autonomic or neuroglycopenic. Now neurogenic symptoms or autonomic symptoms will include trembling, palpitation, sweating, anxiety, hunger, nausea, etc. While in neuroglycopenic, mainly affecting the brain in the form of difficulty in concentration, confusion, weakness, drowsiness, altered level of consciousness, visual disturbances, difficulty in speech, dizziness, all these symptoms which suggest brain is not receiving adequate quantity of sugar. And depending upon the symptoms of autonomic and neuroglycopenic symptoms, it is divided into mild, moderate and severe. Mild is autonomic symptoms are present and person is able to have self-treatment while moderate has got both symptoms, autonomic as well as neuroglycopenic. An individual is able to have self-treatment even in that condition. While severe, usually because of altered level of consciousness, now he requires an assistance of another person and blood sugar level is less than 50. This is described as severe. Depending upon this, now we will be going through all the other different terminology as well as etiology, what are those. So we usually divide into non-diabetic and diabetic person, symptom wise autonomic and neuroglycopenic symptoms and severity wise mild, moderate and severe. These are the few terms which we should be aware of it. There is something called as a people try. This try is described in a patient with spontaneous hypoglycemia who is not on an oral hypoglycemic agent or insulin or any other drug which produces hypoglycemia. Means, Vipal's triad will be there only in case of spontaneous hypoglycemia where person is not on treatment for diabetes or any other drug which can produce hypoglycemia. 
and there are three parts in that Whipple triad because it is triad. What symptoms of hypoglycemia? You demonstrate hypoglycemia by blood sugar examination less than 50, and those symptoms which were present gets relieved after ingesting glucose or parenteral glucose. And when Whipple triads is mentioned, one classically thinks of insulinoma. But these features are not the specific for insulinomas. So this is what is called as Whipple triad. And we have already divided into three: mild, where adrenergic symptoms are present; moderate, where adrenergic and neuroglycopenic symptoms are present. And usually, blood sugar is less than 50. While in a mild, it is less than 70. And in a severe, person is got altered level of consciousness. Almost person is unconscious, where blood sugar level will be very low. So that is classical Whipple triad. Now there are different figures by different society. ADA says less than 70 or lower is considered as hypoglycemia. European agency says 54 and less than 54 is labeled as hypoglycemia. Now, symptoms of hypoglycemia will occur if hypoglycemia blood sugar level is between 62 to 84. Medical clinic, many clinical trials has cut off, cut off limit level less than 56. Recently, 83 milligram would be a reason for hypoglycemia, and at this level, the counter regulation is stimulated. But by and large. Everyone agrees blood sugar level less than 70 in a diabetic person and in a non diabetic person less than 50. Now, that figure changes marginally depending upon the which algorithm you are using. In a neonatal, this figure changes further. In neonatal, diagnostic criteria says if infants has got blood sugar less than 45 with clinical symptoms and signs that is compatible with hypoglycemia and if it is less than 30 the infant is at the risk of severe hypoglycemic symptoms and signs and then morbidity and mortality. Now there are some terminology which are very frequently utilized we already mentioned mild, moderate and severe. There will be one group who will be asymptomatic and still blood sugar source level less than what has been described as hypoglycemia. There is another term called as a relative hypoglycemia. And there is one more term called as probable hypoglycemia in which we use presence of symptom signs and blood sugar levels. We will be dealing with those particular terminology. Another way to differentiate is fasting and postprandial. A healthy person and a sick person, a person with a high level of insulin, it is hyperinsulinemic person and person with a low insulin level, that will be another way of putting them in a different groups. We already mentioned mild, moderate and severe. Then fasting and postprandial, this is the common terminology which is being utilized. And one more which we have already mentioned, diabetic and non-diabetic. Usually in a diabetic, they are hypoinsulinemic and non-diabetic may be having hyperinsulinemia. So that is the different way of putting all this terminology. We already mentioned hypoglycemia. The person will have autonomic or neuroglycopenic symptoms. And when the blood sugar becomes less than 70 in diabetic and less than 50 in a non-diabetic person, there is one term called is a reactive hypoglycemia which is following a gastrectomy due to hyperinsulinism or hyperinsulinemia resulting from a rapid gastric emptying of ingested food from stomach into small intestine. There is one more term called is a pseudo hypoglycemia. This is when the blood sample is untreated 
test tube blood sample is collected in an untreated test tube and there is a delay in estimating the blood sugar level so sugar is utilized by high leukocyte count or a high rbc count or because of technical problems hello ah ah ha ka samandho ne muki de amna pachi karu chu vaat ha bandho ne bandho ne pachi karu chu vaat atyare lecture karu chu chal muk ha chal then there is something called as a spontaneous hypoglycemia when hypoglycemia occurs in a non diabetic person it is called as a spontaneous hypoglycemia and this is classically seen in one condition we call as insulinoma we should keep this thing in mind where insulin level will be very high and there will be some tumor either in the pancreas or outside the pancreas which is secreting insulin most commonly seen in a pancreatic tumors also this will be very very common in some of the groups like person with large bout of alcohol or cerebral malaria or even sepsis or septic shock also sometime in a person who is on treatment with quinine particularly in case of a malaria pfelsiparum malaria then we call as a fluoroquinolones particularly catifloxacillin also in patient with endocrine disorders like hypopituitarism hypoadrenalism all this condition can have spontaneous hypoglycemia there are some terminology which are being utilized very frequently and depending upon that we call classification of hypoglycemia in a diabetic person and non diabetic person in a diabetic person we use a severe hypoglycemia as one terminology documented symptomatic hypoglycemia probable symptomatic hypoglycemia asymptomatic hypoglycemia or hypoglycemic unawareness relative hypoglycemia will be just explaining all those terminology and in a non diabetic person two common terms that is reactive we also called as postprandial and non reactive we call that as a fasting now we'll be going through all those terms there is one more term which is very frequently in person with a diabetic or in a non diabetic person we call it as a pseudo hypoglycemia where blood sugar level are low in a laboratory due to delayed estimation of sugar in a blood sample where sugar is utilized by a cell either by wbc cell high wbc cell or high rbc cells like polycythemia or leukemia and that gives a false report of low sugar this is labeled as pseudo hypoglycemia now there is something called as a reactive hypoglycemia or postprandial hypoglycemia which is in non diabetic person and we have already explained before that whenever a person who has undergone a gi surgery where the digested food material from the stomach rapidly enters into a small intestine like dumping syndrome and this particular produce is postprandial hypoglycemia and that is also labeled as reactive hypoglycemia there is one more term called as a idiopathic reactive hypoglycemia which requires fulfillment of the wipel strike to be the true diagnosis then this is labeled as idiopathic reactive hypoglycemia and some patient may have a symptoms but normal blood sugar they need no further work up in spite of their insistence that is a one group of people particularly in a non diabetic people there is another term called as a non reactive fasting hypoglycemia or non reactive hypoglycemia which can be divided into iatrogenic or factitious or fasting 
Now this is very clear that person fasting hypoglycemia means without having a meal. So iatrogenic is created by the person himself or by a common overall causes. So commonest causes like alcohol abuse, oral hypoglycemic agents, sepsis, renal failure, liver failure, etc. While factitious word very commonly utilized in a person who is unable to maintain the glucose level with fasting. So these are the terminology which are being utilized as a fasting hypoglycemia or a non-reactive hypoglycemia in a non-diabetic person. Why? There are few terms which are being utilized. Severe hypoglycemia, we have already mentioned. The person has got both group of symptoms in the form of autonomic symptoms, neuroclycopenic symptoms plus blood sugar level is very low and he requires and help of another person for the treatment and usually he has got altered level of consciousness that is labeled as severe hypoglycemia and invariably he will require parenteral replacement of sugar. A documented symptomatic hypoglycemia is person who is having a typical symptoms and signs. Along with that, the blood sugar level is less than 70. While asymptomatic hypoglycemia means person is having no symptoms and signs and he is asymptomatic. This is one group of people who we also call unaware. And this is a dangerous group because when they are unaware of the symptoms, they can go into severe hypoglycemia and then complications. There is another group of people who we labeled as probable symptomatic hypoglycemia where they have got the typical symptoms but there is no clinical evidence by laboratory estimation. Either we have got a normal blood sugar level or we are not able to do a blood sugar. We will label that as a probable symptomatic hypoglycemic. And relative means typical symptoms. But the blood sugar level is more than 70. That is relative hypoglycemia. And this is seen very frequently in a person who had known diabetic since long period. Even if that blood sugar level drops to say 80, 90 also, they start getting symptoms and signs. And these are all the terminology which are utilized in a diabetic person. We already mentioned mild, moderate and severe. So, those particular terminology is utilized again very frequently in both groups depending upon the presence of symptoms and signs plus laboratory picture. But severe where almost you might require an intravenous or parenteral glucose replacement and may require glucagon. That is severe variety. Now, if we go to the etiology, we divide into two big groups, diabetic person and non-diabetic persons. By and large, in the diabetic person, it is person who is on excess of insulin or particularly sulfonylurea, which is secretogogus and person on other oral hypoglycemic agents or on insulin and sulfonylurea and he skips the meal. These are the common person who are diabetic person and who are likely to develop hypoglycemia. But in a non-diabetic person, we divide into two big groups, postprandial or fasting. Postprandial is usually due to the some type of a surgery which a person has undergone like gastrectomy or partial gastrectomy or gastro jejunostomy etc or person develops a fructose intolerance at all those things and in a fasting imbalance between production and utilization and particularly person who has got hormone deficiency like endocrine disorders like hypopituitarism 
hypoadrenalism those particular group of disorders or severe liver disease severe end stage renal disease end stage liver failure those particular group or over utilization of sugar because of hyperinsulinism like classical example insulinoma certain drugs etc this is one way of remembering if you want to remember by a menomics like insulinoma i for insulinomas insulin therapy n for non insulinomas s for sepsis u for uremia or renal failure l for liver failure insulin antibody syndromes n for nutritional prolonged fasting oral hypoglycemic agent m for malaria and quinine therapy during pfalciparum and adrenal insufficiency out of this insulinomas comes topmost on the list second common sepsis third common renal failure and liver failure these are the most common groups yes in a diabetic person oral hypoglycemic agent excess of insulin skipping of meals etc and do not forget pfalciparum can produce severe hypoglycemia and person on a pfalciparum with quinine therapy also can develop hypoglycemia and rare in endocrine deficiency like adrenal also in case of a pain hypopituitarism etc so looking at the organ failure renal hepatic cardiac and endocrine wise adrenal hypoadrenalism pituitary failures decreased production of glucagon hypo cortical hypoadrenalism and hypopituitarism where acth and growth hormones production is reduced so roughly in adult usually we divide into two big groups very common in adults drugs particularly insulin and insulin secreted glucose like what we call as sulfonylureas alcohol very very common and particularly do not forget quinine during pfalciparum among critical illness liver failure renal failure cardiac failure and sepsis most commonly seen in an icu as far as hormone deficiency is concerned hypoadrenalism both glucocorticoids as well as total adrenal insufficiency glucagon and epinephrine deficiency non islet cell tumors particularly producing excess of insulin like insulinomas etc endogenous hyperinsulinism insulinomas accidental or we call spontaneous hypoglycemia that can be one big groups these are some of the conditions like incorrect insulin administration exogenous insufficient carbohydrates intake is reduced decrease endogenous glucose production because of liver failure increase utilization of carbohydrates particularly say in a case of sepsis critically ill patients increase insulin sensitivity delayed gastric emptying decrease insulin clearance etc all this can be the predisposing factor for hypoglycemia these are all the risk factors lifestyles drugs medical diseases endocrine related hypopituitarism hypothyroidism hypoadrenalism and particularly in a old individual cognitive impairment like wernicke's encephalopathy autonomic neuropathy gastrointestinal neuropathy all this can play a role in case of hypoglycemia there is a big list at leisure time you can go through these are all the risk factors mentioned here these are the common risk factors these are less common risk factors we already mentioned before again at your leisure time you can go through now if we go through the pathophysiology you know that insulin helps in utilizing the glucose by all cells 
and counter regulatory systems are all these different hormones that is growth hormone glucocorticoids glucagon thyroid hormones catecholamine epinephrine all these counter regulatory hormones helps in increasing the sugar level hence now if any condition which increases the insulin production and any condition which decreases the production of this counter regulatory hormone will be prone to hypoglycemia if insulin production is normal and counter regulatory hormones production is also normal then there will be less chance of getting hypoglycemia now what happens when the blood sugar level goes down as soon as the blood sugar goal level goes down pancreas will be stimulated to increase the production of glucagon and insulin production will be reduced that will be acting on a liver because glucagon production is increased you will have increased output of glucose from liver which will try to increase the blood sugar level as well as there is a brain which will be stimulated and pituitary gland brain which is stimulated you will have a sympathetic system stimulation and because of sympathetic system stimulation you will have a increase release of hormones from adrenal glands in the form of epinephrine and norepinephrine acetylcholine this will be the hormones which will be stimulated pituitary gland is stimulated which will release growth hormone and acetyl growth hormone will also helps in increasing the blood sugar level in blood acetyl hormone will be acting on adrenal gland releases cortisol and cortisol will be also playing a role in increasing blood sugar level so epinephrine will be acting on a liver to release glucose will be acting on a kidney to increase the reabsorption of glucose as well as norepinephrine and acetylcholine as well as cortisol will also play a role on kidney will play a role on muscle will also play a role on fat and all these three will help in increasing the blood sugar level and try to bring it back to normal these are all counter regulatory mechanism counter regulatory mechanism same thing is explained here in a second diagram you can see that there are peripheral centers which will be acting on pancreas and will be acting on central nervous system and by acting on a central nervous system how it will be acting on a kidney muscle fat as well as liver and while acting on a pancreas it will stimulate glucagon production by alpha cell and it will inhibit the production of insulin and that is how it will be helping to maintain the blood sugar level and increasing the blood sugar level again same explained in this diagram in a case of a type 1 diabetes mellitus there will be increased neurogenic symptoms so that will be more in case of a type 1 group of diabetic people and also there will be increased epinephrine which will be playing a role in a type 1 diabetes mellitus this is little bit in more detail whenever you are interested you can go through at your leisure time same thing i explained here what will be happening to insulin glucagon catecholamine glucocorticoid growth hormone and thyroid hormone and where will be the effect it is all explained here this is little bit in more detail but the highest effect will be by insulin level will be reduced glucagon level will be increased catecholamine and glucocorticoid level will be increased this will be the main hormone which will be playing a role as far as the counter regulatory hormones as far as the growth hormone and thyroid hormone role is relatively little less as compared to glucagon catecholamines and glucocorticoids at least a time you can go through what will be the effect on peripheral uptake glycolysis neoglucogenesis glycogenesis glycogenolysis lipogenesis lipolysis protein catabolism and net effect net effect we know that in all these three there will be good increase in the blood sugar level growth hormone will be playing a minor role thyroid hormone will be also playing a minor role 
this is that same effect shown in a different patterns that hypoglycemia will decrease the insulin level will increase the glucagon level will increase epinephrine growth hormone and cortisol so these are the four we call as a counter regulatory hormones and they will have effect on lipolysis insulin sensitivity protein metabolism hepatic glucose output etc and final result is glucose level will be elevated in blood but what is going to happen because of hypoglycemia because of hypoglycemia autonomic nervous system is stimulated as well as pancreas is stimulated where in pancreas glucagon secretion is increased insulin secretion is reduced now this stimulation of autonomic nervous system and sympathetic system that is going to produce you the symptoms and signs this is what is happening to elevate the sugar level same thing now we are going to have what is going to happen as far as symptoms and signs is concerned i am going to this is one way of explaining as the blood sugar level goes down first initially there is an inhibition of insulin when it goes down further there is stimulation of glucagon release and sympathetic system is stimulated so release of adrenaline and growth hormone further lowering cortisol is released autonomic symptoms will start and further lowering now you will have a cognitive that is neuroglycopenic symptoms will start and when it goes to 30 we call severe neuroglycopenic symptoms in the form of coma and seizures this is in brief so first response is decrease in insulin level second response is increase in glucagon level further lowering you will have epinephrine level will be elevated cortisol level and growth hormone level so these are what we call as a counter regulatory hormones and when level goes below 50 now you will have a neuroglycopenic symptoms and signs which will be appearing so first line defense mechanism second line defense mechanism and third line defense mechanism that is first line is insulin lower insulin level will be lower glucagon level will be increased epinephrine level will be increased so this is first second and third line defense mechanism and then once the level goes below 50 now you will start having neuroglycopenic symptoms in the form of altered level of consciousness person may become unconscious and seizures may appear so same thing is shown here inhibition of insulin release of glucagon and epinephrine autonomic symptoms and glucocorticoidopenic symptoms look neuroglycopenic symptoms then dysfunctions widespread eeg changes that is in the form of seizures and unconsciousness will be appear now also because of sympathetic system stimulated there is an effect on the heart so you will have increase heart workload increase force of contraction increase oxygen demand qt is prolonged flattening of t wave st depression person is having a chance of developing ectopic ventricular ectopic beats ventricular tachycardia atrial fibrillation this will be the effect because of increased release of adrenaline noradrenaline we call sympathetic adrenal response on a heart on a brain neurocognitive dysfunction dementia seizures brain failure brain injury prolonged cerebellar ataxia etc while in a eye diplopia retinal sensitivity is reduced hence you will have a difficulty in vision retinal response is also reduced viability will be also affected and sometime you can have a loss of vision also which can become long standing findings other regulatory mechanism inflammation is stimulated in the form of c reactive protein is elevated interleukins levels are elevated interleukin 6 levels are elevated vascular endothelial growth factors level is also elevated there is a endothelial dysfunction and there is a peripheral vasodilatation is reduced and person develops vasoconstriction 
blood coagulative mechanism is being stimulated in the form of factor 7 is stimulated neurophilic activation and platelet activation takes place all this together is dangerous for the life and that is shown here also so increased inflammation in the form of crp growth factor interleukin 6 endothelial dysfunctions decreased vasodilatation indirectly vasoconstriction blood coagulative mechanism is stimulated and you can have abnormal rhythms in the form of ventricular ectopics tachycardia atrial fibrillations also increased demand and you will have a increased heart workload and person can develop cardiovascular complications these are dangerous complications so in a persistent severe hypoglycemia person can have abnormal coagulation abnormal endothelial dysfunctions and inflammatory response peripheral vasoconstriction and cardiovascular complications and sometimes even person can succumb to death i don't have to mention anything these two people are always confused now we'll be going to what we call as symptoms and signs we have already discussed my by and large there are autonomic symptoms in moderate to severe there are both autonomic as well as neuroglycopenic symptoms and in severe there are very severe neuroglycopenic symptoms we have already discussed before so i am little bit skipping over so mild less than 70 moderate less than 55 severe they say that less than 50 and even when it goes below 40 person will start having convulsions hypothermia and person will be unconscious in a mild early adrenergic symptoms will be there in a moderate group both adrenergic as well as neuroglycopenic symptoms are there and in a severe convulsions coma and cold clammy extremities these are in general all the symptoms which are being described which is a mixture of both we call autonomic and neuroglycopenic symptoms at your leisure time you can go through it is given in a diagrammatic patient pattern so you will be able to remember much better there are a lot of diagrams you can see here shaky tachycardia sweating blurred vision person is excessively hungry anxious dizzy weakness headache irritable majority of the symptoms are what we call as autonomic symptoms but when persons start getting visual disturbances then fatigue confusion brain fog sickiness etc those will be neuroglycopenic symptoms brain involvement will be more common in case of a moderate to severe cardiovascular complication will be also more common with severe variety of hypoglycemia hence these two symptoms brain and cardiovascular symptoms suggest that person is likely to have severe hypoglycemia in the form of in a brain blackouts that is syncope ideally it is not a syncope but it is dizziness seizures coma cognitive dysfunctions more in favor of a severe hypoglycemia ischemic chest pain cardiac arrhythmia again more in favor and person gets a fall and secondary to fall there will be very high chance of fractures dislocations head injury etc which further aggravates the morbidity and mortality here together combined in severe hypoglycemia blood sugar level will be as low as 40 neuroglycopenic symptoms are present and neurogenic symptoms will be also present documented wise the person if the symptoms is present hypoglycemia is most likely to be severe and neuroglycopenic symptoms are also present in asymptomatic neuroglycopenic or neurogenic symptoms are absent usually they are not present but blood sugar level is less than 70 
इम्प्रॉबेबल पर्सन इज हैविंग अ न्यूरोजेनिक सिम्टम्स एंड देर मे बी सम सिम्टम्स ऑफ न्यूरोग्लाइकोपेनिक बट वी डोंट हैव अ क्लिनिकल एविडेंस ऑफ लो ब्लड शुगर इन द फॉर्म ऑफ लेबोरेटरी रिपोर्ट इट इज नॉट कन्फर्म बाय लेबोरेटरी रिपोर्ट एंड इन रिलेटिव यूजली नॉर्मल ब्लड शुगर लेवल बट likely to be having a lower than usual for the patient that will be person is having some symptoms in the form of neuroglycopenia and neurogenic symptoms and blood sugar level are tremendously low sometimes we see this type of patient the person is having a blood sugar level say 40 60 and person is fully conscious but person may be having some symptoms in the form of little increase hunger little sweating etc and person is not having a severe neuroglycopenic symptoms and this pseudo hyperglycemia is very frequently because of faulty laboratory report because of delayed sugar testing there is one more term which is being utilized that is hyperglycemia on awareness this is very very dangerous one because the person who is already hypoglycemic but still not having a symptoms so that will be this particular group asymptomatic hypoglycemia so in that group person is having no symptoms but blood sugar level may be tremendously low this is probably because of few conditions like person is on a beta blockers because of that beta blockers adrenergic symptoms are blocked and person is not aware of those hypoglycemic adrenergic symptoms that is one very very common or person is on some psychiatric drugs particularly ssri etc and good number of time person with a prolonged diabetes mellitus will have autonomic dysfunction and that can also predispose to hypoglycemic unawareness there is also one term called is a nocturnal hypoglycemia which is again usually asymptomatic and a patient gives a history of night sweat poor quality of sleep morning headache hangover chronic fatigue vivid dreams nightmares restlessness muscle twitching even sometimes convulsions this is again because of unawareness and poor response to hypoglycemia either because of beta blocker or because of ssri or because of autonomic dysfunctions or autonomic neuropathy due to chronic diabetes mellitus so there are three categories of hypoglycemic awareness normal awareness where the individual is always aware of onset of hypoglycemia partial awareness and third group no awareness this is most dangerous because person with a severe hypoglycemia will not be aware of and he will get a bad damage to brain and might die because of cardiovascular complications in the form of cardio arrhythmias cardiac arrhythmias so these are the three groups you can come across normal awareness partial awareness and totally no awareness and so this no awareness becomes a dangerous group there is now one more term we use we call insulin shock there is a fall of blood glucose level that is when between 50 to 70 cns excitability takes place in the form of anxiety tremors etc we call autonomic symptoms when goes to 20 to 50 convulsions coma and when it is below 20 severe deep coma and damage to brain and this is because of high level of insulin particularly either because of exogenous insulin excess or because of endogenous insulin excess in case of hyperinsulinemia hyperinsulin level in blood secondary due to hyperinsulin secretions from insulin secreting tumors as far as laboratory report is concerned the first what is most important is the blood sugar level and to differentiate the cause of hypoglycemia whether it is because of insulin excess 
you will have to go for insulin level c peptide level this will be the two other important investigation which or you can go for pro insulin level antibody against insulin particularly gada you will have to estimate the level of insulin in blood electrolyte imbalance particularly in case of a renal disease liver function test to find out the liver failure then endocrine disorders in the form of a hypopituitarism hypoadrenalism you will have to do the level of cortisol level thyroid hormones levels growth hormone levels etc and then to find out the etiology you can go for eco ecg x ray chest ct and mri of brain to find out the hypopituitarism hypoadrenalism etc so this will be the big list i am not going into that detail so for finding out the insulin tumors you will have to go for insulin level in the blood c peptide levels and also you will have to go for ct scan of abdomen to find out the pancreatic tumors the most important common we go for a vipal strat we do the blood sugar estimation give a sugar and person improves classical vipal strat in finding out the postprandial reactive hypoglycemia in a postprandial level there will be decreased sugar instead of normal sugar or elevated sugar person will be having decreased sugar we call is a post absorptive hypoglycemia or a postprandial hypoglycemia so cardinal test is a blood sugar level before therapy either by finger pricks or by venous blood then depending upon the etiology suspected you can go for investigation for sepsis in the form of a cbc and try to find out the site of infection fasting hypoglycemia or factitious hypoglycemia you go for c peptide level insulin level etc so first differential diagnosis factitious that is you want to identify whether it is because of insulin or because of oral hypoglycemic agent or because of insulinoma or autoimmune you will have to go for c peptide level then urinary plasma level of sulfonylureas etc drug levels then go for autoimmune that is antibody against insulin receptors or insulin and then go for a pro insulin level or c peptide level etc to find out insulin secreting tumors so this is a flow charts showing you that particular so first always c peptide level though that will help you to identify differentiate between insulin secreting tumors will have a very high level of c peptide while factitious will have a low level of c peptides so accordingly you can go through same thing is mentioned here c peptide level will be reduced insulin level will be high here c peptide level will be reduced in case of exogenous insulin if both are elevated it is more in favor of insulin tumors if all pro insulin insulin and c peptide level are elevated that will be more common in sulfonylureas and in insulin auto antibody is present only in case of a insulin autoimmune mechanisms and you will have a insulin receptor autoimmune antibody will be present in case of a insulin receptor pathophysiology this is same shown and these are the level which are being shown at your leisure time you can go through as far as differential diagnosis is concerned you should try to first differentiate between diabetic and non diabetic then fasting and postprandial there is one more we always use the word postprandial that is dumping syndrome and mild moderate and severe you will have to differentiate those three so that can be from history and then laboratory investigations 
as far as management is concerned we have to be very very precautious first is treatment of hypoglycemia irrespective of whatever may be the cause second is prevention of hypoglycemia and third you have to educate the person the first is if person is having a mild hypoglycemia oral glucose can be given if person is fully conscious but if person is having a severe hypoglycemia do not make an attempt to give oral sugar start with iv dextrose 50 ml of 50% dextrose if person responds dramatically and person has now become fully conscious now you can give a oral carbohydrate diet that will be discussing and many patient may require continuous dns infusion and person who does not respond in spite of a 50% dextrose you might have to give a glucagon and then last is strict the basic condition or what we call the basic etiology so do not add sugar to oral juice recheck the blood sugar after 15 minutes of giving a oral sugar or after giving a iv dextrose until the blood sugar is maintained at the normal level then you can give a slow absorption of glucose material do not give a high fat diet because it will decrease the absorption of glucose person should be educated and person should carry a fast sugar which are absorbed very rapidly from stomach if a meal is given one hour away follow with protein and complex carbohydrate diet if person is unconscious or confused or drowsy and person is not able to swallow properly he is getting vomiting do not force to give anything orally person should be nil bow by mouth these are all called golden rules so any person who gets a blood sugar level less than 40 there are two groups one is asymptomatic and second is symptomatic symptomatic is very easy to treat immediately you can give a blood sugar you can give iv glucose after giving iv glucose if the person dramatically improves blood sugar becomes more than 50 is stable for 24 hours then slowly weaning should be done and then you can switch over from iv fluids to oral if person blood sugar does not improve you still give iv sugar and if it doesn't improve then you will have to go for glucagon if person is asymptomatic and blood sugar is between 20 to 40 if person is able to take orally then only give oral fits if person is not able to take oral fits do not make an attempt to give orally start same like asymptomatic groups so whenever you give orally it is 15 grams of fast acting carbohydrate should be given recheck after 15 minutes and then again again 15 grams of fast acting carbohydrate is given till blood sugar is maintained between 80 to 130 so we call rule of 15 15 grams repeat the blood sugar after 15 minutes if does not gets elevated again give a 15 grams repeat the blood sugar after 15 minutes till blood sugar is maintained more than 80 same shown in a different pattern suspected hypoglycemia how you approach and this is to find out simultaneously the etiology also that is whether it is insulinoma whether it is because of sulfonylurea or it is a autoimmune or it is exogenous insulin or it is a reactive hypoglycemia or you have ruled out hypoglycemia so this is a very nice chart at your leisure time you can go through this is when person is stable you try to investigate 
but when person is symptomatic and blood sugar level is very low don't try to go for insulin level c peptide level that you can do later on but first bring the sugar level at least to above 80 again same what we have mentioned here it is same in little different patterns at your leisure time you can go through most important is prevention of hypoglycemia use a drug which produces less hypoglycemia or there is a decrease chance of hypoglycemia and then you can go for treatment of hypoglycemia steps recognize hypoglycemia confirm treat with oral glucose or with iv glucose till person blood sugar level comes to a stable level and person is fully conscious this we have already mentioned give 15 g of glucose and repeat the sugar after 15 g what to be utilized is mentioned here at your leisure time you can go through what not to give do not give chocolate bars whole milk cheese etc in case of a severe hypoglycemia where person is unconscious you can apply a honey paste in the mouth but even if this can be avoided avoid because if person is not able to swallow properly you will have a chance of aspiration and if person is vomiting aspiration pneumonias and aspiration respiratory complication will be higher yes if blood sugar level does not gets elevated in spite of iv now you will have to use glucagon and every instruction is given on those this person should be having in his emergency kit so this is how to utilize the glucagon in detail it has been mentioned if a person is having severe hypoglycemia injection glucagon this is can be utilized you will have to give 1 mg in adult and 0.5 mg in children has to be given straight intramuscular or subcutaneous best way is to give a intramuscular injection prevention is always better so identify and address the cause encourage smbg that is self monitoring educate the person insulin and oral hypoglycemic should be properly given rational use ongoing guidance should be there person should be well educated person should carry a belt or a card in which every detail is being mentioned that i am diabetic i am on so and so drug please help me check blood sugar 4 to 6 time per day carry glucose tablets have glucagon kits what you should do what you should not do 6 meals per day with snacks in between keep a daily accounts sugar alcohol and tobacco should be avoided keep your blood sugar stable replace junk foods by nutritious foods vegetable fruits etc should be preferred do not get panic do not forget to eat breakfast everyone are different so depending upon the person try to utilize avoid alcohol do not obsess about your diet etc the most common complication which occurs in a hypoglycemia is a brain damage repeated hypoglycemia will slowly produce mental retardation your cognitive function will be impaired so person will start developing dementia person will have a very high chance of repeated seizures coma and even person can die so man with a watch knows what time it is and a man with a two watch is never sure do remember this so fear of hypoglycemia seizures permanent neurological deficit coma and death are the common complications so these are all complications morbidity and mortality which can happen in a diabetic cns complication and cardiac 
particularly cardiac arrhythmia and myocardial infarction are the common cause of sudden cardiac death in a hypoglycemia. And in a case of CNS, coma, convulsions, and brain damage, irreversible brain damage can happen. As far as eye is concerned, you can have visual disturbances, vitreous hemorrhage, hypothermia, accidental injury, head injury, those can be there. So take home message, always take a proper dose, do not have fastings. So this is in summary, hypoglycemia is often neglected complications. Mild hypoglycemia reduces the quality of life. Severe hypoglycemia can produce a dangerous complication, life-threatening complication and sometimes even a death. Careful attention will prevent the chances of life-threatening hypoglycemia. To improve the diabetic-related outcome, you should reduce the chance of hypoglycemia. You should educate the person. Try to switch over the person to a newer anti-diabetic medication which has got little or no risk of hypoglycemia because there are good number of drugs where the chance of hypoglycemia are minimum and newer and newer strategies should be utilized during treatment of diabetes mellitus and person should be well educated. So I end my lecture here. Thank you all for taking out time. I know that your time is valuable and I appreciate you for spending some of the time with me. Thank you once again for spending the time. If you like this lecture, do not forget to give a thumbs up. And if you feel this lecture is helpful to you and your friends, you can share with your friends. Do not forget to give a comment so that I can improve. Again, all my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. This will be beneficial to all fourth year students, interns and the person who are practicing because hypoglycemia is one of the most common complications in both type 1 as well as type 2 diabetes mellitus. See you in next lecture.